Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Dying to Know podcast. I'm Diane Dobry, and our guest on today's podcast is Caitlin Donahue, who's from Long Island. And we connected when we were both commenting in the chat on the live recording of Chris Brennan's astrology podcast for the month of April. Caitlin is a musician who plays guitar. She's studied sound recording technology. She's musical merchandising that included acoustics. And she has a strong interest in astrology. Based on her knowledge of music, acoustics, the readings and lessons she's pursued related to numerology and astrology, her interests are focused on the connection between astrology and music. And she's here today to tell us about her theories and her understandings of these ideas. Welcome to the podcast, Caitlin. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you. Great to meet you. So my introduction of you obviously didn't describe your background and current work in a lot of detail. Can you give us a better understanding of what brought you to this point? Sure. So like you said, I have a musical background. I went to school for music at first sound recording technology and then switch over to music business. But during the sound recording technology phase of it, definitely studied acoustics and uh, the, the science of sound really. And then so fast forward to current day where I'm very, very interested in astrology. And it kind of, that was in the back of my head, but it kind of stemmed from what is astrology? Is it a language? Is it a science? Is it an art? And I kind of kept feeling like there was this musical pull for astrology when I would look at a chart. And so I kind of, it finally just dawned on me. It's like, I feel like if I was going to explain astrology in any which way, I would say it is best described as something comparable to music theory. And in which case, I mean, like, you know, we know that major tones, for example, sound um, happy and minor tones sound sad. There's no scientific, absolute concrete proof about that. It's just subjective, but it's something that we all seem to agree on. And I feel like that's very similar to astrology in terms of like, you know, we know Venus and Libra or Taurus is really good. Can we prove it? No. And, and a lot of these things, a lot of it was quality-based versus, um, you know, absolute concrete. And then eventually this ties into human emotions and feelings and stuff, but it really started from trying to figure out the connection between music, tones, frequencies, and astrology really, and, and how the placements could be affected in that way. Yeah. I think when we were chatting last week, I mentioned that my dissertation study looked at the paranormal shows on television and I connected the discussions on those shows with the music in the background. And we were talking about some of the sounds like yeah. Lasando and the devil's chord that are used frequently in um, those shows and to create a certain effect. Exactly. And so like, I was actually just going through some stuff beforehand. And like you said, the uh, devil's tone, tritone, which is actually uh, exactly half of an octave and it gives a very unsteady tension feeling. And then you've got certain tones that have uh, been known, maybe not a hundred percent, but there's definitely theoretical parts about it. Like uh, for healing and meditation, you've got 432 Hertz, uh, Havana syndrome. Uh, I'm not sure what the exact Hertz are, but you know, they were saying there was feelings of vibrations in the head and hearing sudden loud noise. And there was a pain in the ears and it seemed to have to do with a frequency and the brown note, which is the note that makes you have to go number two. Uh, and then you <laughs> go, so from the, the, intervals to the the hertz uh, and the actual tones and then you convey that all the way through into music like the, the glissando for scary music or you know reggae for beach music or you know the the music that you don't even have to see the tv the your screen or whatever you just know that a cute animal video is playing um mm -hmm. so i think that it goes from tones to intervals and then eventually the human characteristic of converting it into music in fact when when i was doing my paper I read that the church forbade anyone to use the devil's chord in, in music. I, I assume oh, for yeah. the church. It, it was outlawed. <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting that they, that they would do that. So there yeah. must be some reason for that. Also, you talk about the Havana syndrome. What is that? I was curious about that. 
That, okay. So I do need to do a little bit more research on this because it is an RF frequency. Um, but in Cuba, where there were some diplomats, I believe, I hope I'm getting that this part all right. Um, <clears throat> some of the uh, US diplomats started to have a really bad headache or really bad symptoms. They, they were not feeling well and they couldn't figure out what it was. And it seems to be, although I don't think it's been 100% figured out, but it seems to be an RF wave or a microwave, they were thinking, but some kind of a frequency that was directed at these people that was used uh, as an attack. Um, so that might not be exactly acoustics because it's you know RF or microwave versus uh, a sound wave, but the same idea of uh, a frequency or, or a vibration of some sort that is being projected towards somebody for a certain purpose that affects human behavior in some way. Yeah, I had heard that something like that was done during the Gulf War as well, but I, I, I don't know the details, but I remember hearing that there was like some kind of psychological like sounds or something directed at people yeah. who are in the fighting you've done a lot of reading on on this and i know that you you are interested in nikola tesla's teachings about vibration what are some of the the major ideas and readings that you've done from either astrologers I think you said somebody has done some kind of connection between astrology and sound or music. Yeah. So um, when it finally started to hit me in terms of exactly which way I wanted to go with this like long-term overall project, um, I was Googling and I did find, I don't know the name off the top of my head, but I know I sent you the link for at least the musical part that some people have noticed a difference. I don't even think they were an astrologer per se. I think they were just trying to make a connection between the planets and tones and frequencies and creating a song for the universe, essentially using the certain tones that uh, the different planets give off. If you were to move them up to an octave where we can actually hear it. So I thought that was really interesting. But in terms of um, Nikola Tesla, it was the quote, if you want to know the secrets to the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. And we know with um, Einstein also saying there is no matter, everything actually just breaks down to energy. And so everything that we perceive as matter is actually just very, very low frequency energy, which means that things are moving all the time. There is no stillness, which means it's everything is giving off energy all of the time. And so when you think about the large scale of the planets, I just thought to myself, well, if we know they're giving off these energies and we know that we can con convert it to a certain tone, wouldn't that be interesting? And so that one guy had already done the project of like making a song for the universe. But really what I'm interested in eventually doing is taking these scientific approaches to sound and energy and finding a human way to create music based on a chart. And the reason why I kept going back to human or, or stuff like that is <clears throat> I think um, a tie-in with music and astrology is also feelings because all three of those things, and a lot of people just throw out astrology to begin with, but, you know, talking to most other people, if we just talk about music and feelings, neither of them can be proven. Neither of them, there, there is no concrete way to prove that you feel any which way. There are certain areas of the brain that might light up, but mm -hmm. it's not a way to absolutely prove how somebody feels. And the reason why I mentioned feelings is if music can create certain feelings that, and you, you know, the feeling when you get the goosebumps on your arms, or you hear a love song or really angry song, it, it conveys an emotion. And that's very similar to what astrology does when you're looking at a chart. It's, it's all about the quality and understanding what you can perceive through that, but it's not concrete, but there is uh, an emotional quality through these charts. I totally understand that, you know, when certain planets, I, when I feel sad or lonely or something, I look on my chart, like, where's the moon today? What's it hitting on my mm -hmm. chart? But let me just show you, this is the one you're talking about, Alba yes. Mundi from the album Universe Sound. Um, I wish I remembered the composer's name, but it's in there. Whoever wants to click through and listen to it, it's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, we'll put that up again later and people can get that information. I'll put it under the video on YouTube and on the website where the podcast is going to be posted. Nikola Tesla, I remember hearing about him doing in some vibration studies and that the, um, the whole building he was in started to vibrate and almost collapsed. So oh, wow. he, he was definitely onto something. He had so many different things and, and the fire in his apartment just kind of destroyed all his, his research. Right.
uh, which is such a shame. He was so, we could have been, who knows where we would have been at this point. But yeah, you know, when we were talking, chatting on um, the astrology podcast, somebody in the discussion that one of the astrologers who was talking mentioned something, I don't know what it was about how all these planets somehow connect and are meaningful. And I had just gone to a classical music concert and it, it just fascinates me to see that somebody wrote all this. Somebody wrote music for the flutes and the, when do the flutes come in? When do the drums come in? When do, when does a French horn fit the mm -hmm. music? And, and how does that tell a story? Because obviously the conductor at these concerts will turn and say, you know, this is what this musical piece is about and how, what kind of story it tells. And, you know, it sounds like you can sense the sunrise and you can right. sense the chattering of the birds and the the wind in the trees and just from the music and the fact that somebody just put notes on paper for different musical instruments and even voices in the choir you know you hear these different who comes in when and how that mixes to make a certain you could feel it you get chills from certain notes and certain connections of notes and I thought when they were talking about it on astrology podcast I said that's what it reminds me of the birth chart has these planets moving they start out in a certain place for you or me and then the planets moving around are like boom 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 it's like okay in come the flutes in come the bass and the violins and the violas and cellos or the, the drums and it just seems like oh all of a sudden they hit and and it gives you a certain it's, kind of it's like uh, orchestrated yeah it's all orchestrated with like the planets but it gives you a certain sensation or a certain uh response to that and and I think you're right you did talk about in our preparation for this that you were looking at math and acoustics and energy waves and how that kind of comes together to put these sounds from the planets that maybe we aren't aware that we're feeling like you talk about dogs you talk about bees yes that bees can see certain colors that we can't dogs can hear sounds that we can't and that maybe what we don't know what we don't know right right and I think I mean, one of the examples I like to think about is just how many different dimensions there are. Um, and obviously, like in terms of like all of our reality, it's three dimensions. Some people say fourth is uh, time. So, that, you know, that's variable. I'm not sure, but at least three dimensions. But it seems to be theoretically that there are probably about 12 dimensions, maybe 11, something like that. And th these are scientific theories that have that have come come about. And yet we can't perceive it. Does that mean that it's any less real? Or is that just something that we can't understand? Because we are only created, our senses are only made to interpret the third dimension. Um, so I, I think that's interesting. I also think in terms of uh, thinking about like how the musicality, like you were talking about before, you know, like, uh, one of the definitions of music is like uh, sound moving through time and astrology is basically the study of planets moving through time. And so mm -hmm. when you add that to the reverberations of everything, and you were talking about a, a trumpet or an oboe or all that kind of stuff. Um, I think one of the things that I also want to get into eventually would be like, we already know that the planets have certain notes kind of given to them uh, based on the frequencies, if they were brought up to our audible level, but also then there's the, how does it sound? Not just the tone, like in Saturn, I always hear it as a very militaristic, like a beat, like <laughs> very steady, very urgently going somewhere, but what is the timbre of it? And I think it would be interesting to go through and really dive into each zodiac sign and get an understanding, a description more, just really describing what kinds of sounds you would expect to hear from certain things like Capricorn is, would be very different from Libra in terms of the uh, embouchure or the, the timbre of the instrument. So I think that would be an interesting approach as well to understanding how music can correlate to astrology. When you say timbre, what what does that mean exactly? You can play a, a note C on a piano and note C on a guitar, but the sound is different because it's coming from two different instruments. Mm -hmm. 
So okay. like the sound wave of like a trumpet is very different from, even though it's the same note, it's going to come through differently based on the acoustics of um, the sound, like the attack um, versus a harp or, or something like that. So the, mm-hmm. the feeling of the instrument um, and how that could work with uh, creating a song based on a birth chart. You also were mentioning to me about the frequencies that they have for healing and meditation. And I know that there was a a story about a guy who had created some kind of a vibration machine and that, that would fight cancer cells. Oh, wow. I think I'm sure I've read briefly about that, but not recently. So tell me whatever you, you, you know, I'm, I'm interested. All I remember reading was that he had done this and, and that it was, um, successful, but that he, it's almost like the guy who invented the the car that didn't run on gas years and years ago, that they kind of, because it wasn't profitable or it was affecting someone else's profits, Mm -hmm. that he was kind of run out of town, like, oh no, that could never work. That's, you know, pseudoscience or something. And it just, it didn't gather support from either monetarily or it was Fought by people who are like, oh, you know, they're, we're making so much money on these, these drugs or whatever. Oh, I don't know that that's exactly what the cause of that frequency, that vibrational healing, you know, not taking flight was. But I would imagine that the way things are with the research that, you know, you're talking about that they're looking into that that could possibly be. You're, you're talking a lot about the, the frequencies of the planets what we know and how they're interacting. I think it's really interesting that you say that about Saturn, the marching, because Saturn is like the the soldier, the yeah, exactly. The disciplinarian. Yeah. Have you heard about any other things like Venus or the sounds of um, um you know, you've got your angelic voices for Venus with some harp, maybe some flute. Mercury, I would expect to be a little bit busier, a little bit more buzzing around, moving around, almost like um, Flight of the Bumblebee is a song I know, Uh (laughs) Um, but uh, something along those lines, just messaging around and bringing stuff, uh, you know, the pollen to each different flower and stuff. Pluto would be much more like the end of Fantasia. (laughs) That's what I would think for uh, Pluto. (laughs) You start to get these characteristics and then like Jupiter would be a trumpet, like when a king is walking into a room. Definitely. So, you know, you start to, but these are the timbres for the planet. So then I'm also going to try and figure out what, how do I include that with the Zodiac as well? And like, one of the things I've been thinking about recently is just, you know, at first I was like, oh my gosh, maybe I can mathematically create the perfect song. I'm like, I don't think that's how it is though, because again, going back to feelings and music and how that there's no concrete way to describe those things exactly. Um, I think just like I was saying to you the other day, I think what's very cool about astrology is that there's always room for more astrologers because there's always a different perspective. And Mm -hmm. in that way, I think creating music based on a birth chart, typically it's not going to be wrong. It's going to be an interpretation of seeing where these placements are, how they interact. And this is through my eyes. This is how I would perceive these placements to be. Yeah, it seems like the birth chart could be our our sheet music, like when we come in. And I'm, I think I mentioned to you that there are cultures that have a song when the child is born. Everybody has their own song and they that's their song through their life until they die. And everybody sings to them on their birthday. They sing their song and they when they die, they sing that song. So it's it's not far fetched to think that the birth chart is part of that music. Totally. I mean, like the first time you look at reading any kind of music, you're like, what is this? I have no idea. Same thing with the birth chart. The first time you look at anything astrology, you're like, what is this? So in some ways it is kind of like a language I would, I would give to that a little bit just because there is like, can you read music or can you read a chart? Like if you can't, then that is, you know, that, that would be in a type of language, but I think music theory, lends its hand a lot more to astrology in the full understanding of it. I'm just, I'm excited for that part. And you also talk about the mathematics. I mean, and you were into numerology Mm -hmm. and the mathematics. I mean, there is mathematics in music, you know, a quarter, a eighth note, a quarter note, a whole note, it's fractions. Do you have an idea about mathematics 
Involved. Well, certainly, certainly like that, but also in terms of the way sound waves uh, bounce off walls. Like, is it 30 degrees? Is it 90 degrees? Like, you know, when I was going through my acoustic textbook from college, uh, I was I was finding all this stuff. I'm like, oh, this seems very similar towards, you know, what uh, astrology, like the, the certain aspects that we're looking at. Um, and on top of that as well, you have like with soundproofing rooms, I was just noticing like the shapes for all the sound dampening stuff. It's always like squares, circles, really? hexagons, triangles. It was just everything, you know, it's it, these same shapes keep coming up over and over again. So how I would love to do like an experiment of having, let's just say one of the notes, which is C in a certain timbre, like a certain instrument, depending on the placement, depending on what planet it is. And then how does it sound when I'm bouncing it off of the wall at 30 degrees or 90 degrees, how does it sound when I have the sound proofing stuff up with the hexagons or with the squares? How can I make that as part of the overall quality of the sound of a song? That would be so interesting to just, you know, do that kind of research and talk about it and then compare it maybe to astrological reading practices. You know, what does a square do? It's it's a hindrance, it's a hurdle to overcome the, the same way the soundproofing is, you know, right. for the that, sound to be heard. And it, right beforehand, right before we got on this, I was uh, looking back at the acoustic book again, and uh, it was just interesting. I'm looking at like a sound wave and that 90 degrees is where it starts to turn back again. So it goes back mm-hmm. down because the sound wave goes up and down and up and down and at 90 degrees. That's where it starts to curve back down. So something that wasn't working maybe together so well before, it's about to start to figure out how to work together again is kind of how I thought about it astrologically. And then at 180 degrees, it cancels out. So it's uh, just, oh. just it, it was interesting. And, and so like my brain just starts going like, uh, you know, how, how can I tie this in? You know, it's, um, I, I think, you know, sacred geometry, math, sound vibrations, it's all something that we can pull from. I just don't know how to concretely put it into evidence, but I can evoke a feeling. That's definitely a great start. And then numerology, was there anything that connects with that and well you know what what always interests me is when i'm listening to astrologers talk they're saying oh the 23 degree point and uh the cardinal signs is important and the anoretic degree point 29 degrees of a sign and i'm thinking how do they know that and why are they saying that they, you know there's not a lot of discussion you have to go and do the research and find it do you have any thoughts about that Not yet, but there are so many different ways that I could look at numerology being applicable towards certain things. I'm not necessarily sure with the degrees, just because with each uh, sign, you know, you've got 30 degrees, 30 degrees, 30 degrees. So every single one is going to have 29, but maybe in reference to the starting point, like your rising sign, like I'm seven degrees Virgo um, and my Venus is 17 degrees Taurus in my ninth house. So like how would that degree difference numerologically compare, make any sense? So I haven't done the math at all whatsoever right now to like figure that out, but I would be more interested in looking at it as the degrees, as the whole chart, not just as 30 degrees per each sign, if you're using whole sign houses. Yeah. I was thinking maybe the 29 degree point, you know, two and nine is 11 and 11 is a master number in numerology. It's a uh, the 1111 on mm-hmm. on the clock is the angel, supposedly the angel uh, time, um, ones, all ones. And then you, you figure with math, you have ones and twos or the bind. Right. That That's binary? what I was thinking. Because I know 11 is a master number, but then even if you just break that down, then you have two. So two would be right. like balance or or the other person. Like if you're going to look at the first and seventh house, I would think two, uh, mm-hmm. so, something along those lines. So how I would bring the numerology in, I don't have that fully fleshed out, but it certainly is something to keep into consideration because I think there's definitely a lot about the quality of um of numbers as well, which sounds crazy to so many people, but when you see it in geometry, it just starts to make sense. Yeah. And the fact that the vibrations are based on rhythms and the rhythms have a certain number of uh, right. beats. Yeah. So, or the wavelength or how many, you know, uh, how many exactly. cycles uh, a sound goes per second, you know? So it's a, uh, it's definitely, that's why it's like, when I was started telling you about this project, I'm like, 
this is good. Like I finally figured out the angle that I wanted to go down after like all this time of like, it was like something bugging me in the back of my head. It was like, I know there's a way to go about this, but I couldn't figure it out. But now that I know I'm like, oh my God, I've got so much research ahead of me. It's like yeah. crazy and it's intimidating. <laughs> so I don't know when I'm going to have my first birth chart song. Cause there's so many things to get, take in consideration. Cause it's also like, um, you know, how does uh, my rising sign correspond to, uh, you know, Neptune in my fifth or, and then how does Neptune in the fifth correspond to, uh, you know, Venus in my ninth, any of those sorts of things. So it's not just the placements, but then the interactions, which uh, has to do with the acoustics really in terms of the angles that everything is at. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where I feel like I could drive myself absolutely crazy. So I'm just going to have to take this in like bite-sized pieces over time and figure out, but certainly finding the person who figured out the notes of each of the planets made my life a hell of a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's definitely a deep dive. And, and it was funny that Chris Brennan posted, I, I sent it to you and I, I yeah. printed out for this, for this interview, but it's something about the retrograde is like going, hearing a piece of music and then going back over to hear it again, or to, to get a little bit more out of the music. And I said, oh, it's so interesting that he's bringing that musical connection up to a retrograde in that totally. way. Oh, no, I loved that. I, I was so excited to see that. And actually just before, when I was thinking about how would I represent a retrograde in music, it's like you could either play the chosen note backwards, which probably wouldn't sound so good. So then I was like, or you could repeat the phrase. You know, there's always like little motifs um, that you can like bring in again, or even using um, the echo effect um, just to have uh -huh. that sound. So, I mean, there's multiple different ways of having the same idea be intertwined into music. Uh, so, which is great because it gives you more creativity per each uh, chart as well. Yeah, the echo effect is interesting because that it's the repeat of that sound over and over and over for right. a certain amount of time. And that's what a retrograde is. And we know Mercury is going to be three weeks and Mars. How much is Mars? Mars can be like up to six. I think the last one when Mars was in Aries. was. Oh, my God. That was it was, was in Aries it? for like months. six months. <laughs> yeah, really it's crazy. And, and that's supposed to happen again in Gemini. So that. That's going to be uh, interesting. Oh, that's interesting. My 10th house. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> see, that's when you'll get, you'll get busy doing your theory, I think. There is so much to look at with this music theory. And, you know, anyone who's like an, an expert in music theory can take those theories and compare them to theories of astrology if they're interested in astrology. And that would be one phase. And you're talking about creating or composing music based on these planets and, and the, the sounds that and vibrations and the timbre, as you said, of how they would be able to be used and put together into something. Um, and there's probably so many different ways that you could Oh, so it. many. <laughs> and, but, and like I said, like it definitely, like when I first started, I, I kept thinking of it as mathematical and like some kind of a somewhat certain feel. And then the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, no, it's, it's about creating, it's about creativity. It's about feelings and music and how you can't pin that down. And I don't think you can pin this down either, but I think it would be really cool to, to, to hear a chart essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Take a look at it and try it, do an experiment with it. Right. Um, and then also maybe do other people's charts and say, does this resonate with you? And oh, why, totally. that would be not? another, I would love to do it, <laughs> but I would love to like not meet the person and just be like, yeah, you right. Me somebody's chart. Let me write up a song and see if this kind of, does it resonate? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like I think when we were ch chatting last week, I mentioned that my mother, my mother was always very much into music and her mother played piano and my mother played violin and sang. And so there's certain classical pieces like I have, I, I keep saying my song and I keep telling my kids, my kids don't pay attention to anything I say about, <laughs> you know, when I die, I want you to play Air on the G String by Bach and uh, Pavan for a Dead Princess, which is Ravel. I said, those are my, those are songs that, that sound almost like um the air on a g-string almost sounds like my life and the pavan for dead princess sounds like the you know resurrection and 
and I just think that that should be for me. And it, it just, every time it comes on it, it you know, it, tears come to my eyes and stuff. Well, my mother, when I play Mastinette, oh my God, she just bursts out crying. And I'm like, <laughs> mom, mom, why are you crying? And she's like, I don't know. I don't, but I have to like, shut it off. Like, I don't know what it is, but there's something about the certain tones that mm-hmm. it starts with. I hear those two tones. I'm like, that's my mother's crying song. But I know that at the time when she, we do do a m- memorial for her someday, we have to play that song. And yeah. I know I'm going to be the one bursting out crying because I know what it meant to her. Oh, so, no, um, but it's very sweet. I mean, it's a uh, music can hit a personal bone in your body for sure. And that's why I'm wondering, like, you know, when those connections happen in a chart, you know, with transits, not just transits, but perfection years and mm-hmm. the progressed planets, you know, as where are they now in, in the chart and right. just the whole connection of those. That's why I kept thinking it's like an orchestrated symphony, these different ways to read the chart and how it affects your life. It just is like music. Like It really is. Notes. Yeah. Cause you were saying, you know, oh, people say it's like a language or um, what else? And I'm not they- knocking that either. I mean, I can't certainly prove any of this, <laughs> you know, this is all theoretical, but. Right. But you're, ha- you have the musical connection. So to you, the music resonates as a theory or an idea for how it could be affecting people. And that, and they're all similar. And I kept kind of going back and forth. I hadn't really thought of it as like describing it as music theory until I was really, you know, first back and forth between, is it like a type of a science? I know not everybody would agree, but but like, or is it like an art? And like, it's not just an art though, because there is some sort of a structure or reasoning for it and Mm -hmm. a reasoning for why we expect certain things to happen at different times. So it's not totally just creative and that's it. There's definitely structure to it, which would be the science part of it. Uh, And I'm like, but it's not science either because we can't prove it. I'm like, well, what else is like that? I'm like, and then the bulb went off. I'm like, oh, that's what music theory is. It's like, I can't prove to you why these things sound the way they do, but I guarantee the vast, like universally, people are going to say major tones sound happy and minor tones sound sad. So much so that you can even teach, like you, you can teach this to little kids and they pick it up right away. Music theory is not scientific, but it is a way of structuring what we know into something that we can understand. And I think just like music theory is not a, you know, it's not concrete. Um, similarly, I was talking about like feelings as well before, like you've got your psychologist and some people think that people who are psychologists are also like out of their mind, just like, um, you know, people who are into astrology or whatever, and all these things, the feelings, the music and the astrology, it can't, it, it's like trying to put your finger on like mercury or something that's squishy. It's like, you can't quite do it, but it's not that it's untrue. It's just the way that our tools that we have right now that we, we can't exactly prove it, but I don't think that that means that it's made up in our heads. I think it's just like you were saying, or I had said to you, and you mentioned before, like bees can see colors. We can't and dogs can hear and smell things. We can't, we only have so many senses. And like I was saying about the dimensions, there's probably more dimensions. Does that make it any less real? Or is it just because we can't perceive stuff? And I think it's extremely hubristic to think that we know everything right now. And I think it's important to keep your mind open to things that just seem to make a little bit too much sense sometimes. And, and I, I think, you know, there is a certain um, intuition, even yes. in science, you know, scientists mm-hmm. get their, their hypotheses based on an intuition from what they already know. And that definitely, and a lot of discoveries are just like dismissed, like, oh, that can't be possible because it hasn't been in the repertoire of scientists. Well, I mean, was it just in, I think it was 2017. Is that when they finally got the first picture of a black hole? So it's like, theoretically, this has been around for a long time. And finally we got like photographic Physical. evidence of something actually existing. And so, it, I, you know, I, I think it's going to be something along those lines. I think that's probably more of the scientific stuff rather than theoretical uh, music or astrology. But just because you can't prove it yet doesn't mean that it's not true. I, I, for me, it's like the only thing I absolutely 100% believe in is that the universe is connected. Everything else 
I don't a hundred percent know, but I'm obviously extremely interested in astrology that I've gotten far down enough down this path that I put a lot of the, my eggs in that basket, but I can't say for certain. So I think it's just kind of insane when uh, somebody can say with absolute certainty that these other things do not work. I'm like, if you cannot prove that it doesn't work, then lack of evidence doesn't mean that it's not true either. I also think uh, just separately, like when we were talking about like music is like, you know, sound moving through time and astrology is the study of planets moving through time. Um, the ideas of the revolutions that the earth does, like one earth revolution around the sun is one year. So our age changes who we are and how we behave based on our age. And then the moon goes around the earth in 28 days, which is also what like a cis woman cycle would be. And our cycle affects when someone could become pregnant and give life with nine months passing in relation to the sun. <laughs> so it's like, there's, there's these time frames with the, the moon and the sun but I think with the idea of like uh, what I was saying before in terms of what we can perceive and what we can't, is it totally insane to think that there might be other cycles of time with these other planets that we just don't have a grasp on or don't understand or don't even have the tools to understand it because our brains can only understand the five senses that we have, you know? So I, I just think the cycles of time is interesting as well in terms of the connection with astrology and music and what we know scientifically truly. Yes, and that recent uh, program, Changing of the Gods, mm. which they they were talking about Pluto and Uranus. Um, mm -hmm. and well, they, I think they did a couple of, I'm, I'm reading the actual book right now. And I, I think I told you, I thought it was going to be each week there's a new episode. So I only saw like two episodes out of the whole uh, thing. But um, I think they go through like a bunch of the different uh, correspondences between like the outer planets. Yeah, the major planets and, and how they affected like with revolutions and mm -hmm. civil wars and the 1960s and the mm -hmm. 80s and how different things were affected in 2020. And, you know, when you really look at it, you see these, in, in fact, Greg Braden, I remember listening to his book, Fractal Time. And as I'm listening to it, I'm like, that's astrology. It's astrology <laughs> because they're saying, oh, where the earth is in the galaxy compared to where it was at certain time periods, we see patterns in the, you know, in yeah. the planets and it's like, it's astrology. I know. And you, uh, you feel like you just want to like, scream it at somebody sometimes. Like it makes me laugh when there's certain things about astrology and you're dealing with a skeptic and they totally don't believe in astrology whatsoever, but then you hear some of the things they're saying, or like, I know somebody who like thinks that astrology is total BS, but is like religious. And, uh, he doesn't think it's like evil or anything like that, but just totally blows it off. And I'm like, you know, they, they talk about astrology basically in the Bible. Now I have not read the Bible the Magi, in terms the of, you Magi know, Saturn. came to, to visit Jesus based yeah. on seeing the star in the sky and Saturn, Jupiter. You know, this is what I tell like my, my friends well, who are very religious will say, you know, astrology is not in the Bible. I said, it is in the Bible. And it, it is. It's, it is not vilified. It right. is praised that these were the wise men. They knew the importance of Jesus's birth because of a star in the sky. So how is that evil? You know, how is right. that the devil? And then the whole thing about Venus, I always think of, you know, as the pentagram, Venus goes through oh, yeah. retrogrades, always the same point in, in, uh, certain signs. And the pentagram is so important in protection against evil. Mm. It's so interesting. I think it would be such a great idea to have a show like the changing of the gods or a conference of musicians and astrologers and making these connections in certain theories and, and putting that sounds that like so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you're a musician to, yeah. to be able to to work with the other people who have that knowledge and putting it all together as a whole study of a new field. It's funny, even like when, uh, like my brother-in-law, like does not believe in any sort of astrology, anything even remotely spiritual or whatever. And yet he's a music teacher. So it's kind of funny when you think about how music is typically described when somebody's trying to make the composer or the conductor understand, do this very 
rigidly or like, you know, there's, there's always these descriptive sounds. I'm like, how cool would it be to be like, do this very Saturnianly or, you know, you can use these archetypal <laughs> exactly. phrases from astrology and put it in. And like it, once your brain, like I always say that astrology, like once you start to get it, it's like a flywheel. Cause like mm. it's when I'm first starting to think about it, I, I don't fully understand the archetypes. I just see these keywords, but then as you're learning it and more and more time is going, then the archetypal flywheel starts to move more and more. And suddenly it just all starts to make sense very much like when you first start learning how to play an instrument, like with guitar, it's like, where do I put my fingers on this fretboard? I don't know. And then suddenly you've got both your right hand, and your left hand working together without even really thinking about it. So just archetypally things just work. And I feel like there's some kind of, because that's, that was actually one of the first things that I noticed or what made me think about me, um, astrology being musical is, and I really can't fully explain this, but it, it's true. I felt like my brain was working in the same way that it does with music. And you can't uh -huh. feel your brain working. I get that. But there's some, there was something mentally right. there that I'm like, once that flywheel started to go, I'm like, oh, I get this. Oh, this makes sense. This is like when I finally understand how to play a song fully and I don't have to look back at the notes. I'm like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. But there is, I would be fascinated if there's anybody who can do, do some like sort of study. like an FMRI or something. Like right? You know. Yeah, that's what I mean. Some sort of an EKG, whatever it is, some kind of study on the brain when somebody is like really, really in their astrology mode or that zone, not just, you know, because there's talking about it, but then when you really get into that zone, the way, you know, on astrology podcast, they'll talk about that. Like when it becomes like a poem or something like that, when you get into that mindset and, and the same thing in terms of like, when your brain starts to understand a song and how to just naturally play it, you know, I, I think it would be very interesting to see the, the comparison, uh, scientifically with people's brains. Yeah. You said something about the finger movement on the uh, strings yeah. was connected to something in astrology in your mind. Well, it's kind of like, like with my left hand, figuring out where my hand should go on the guitar on the fretboard. Okay, so these are the planets and these are their keywords. Okay, great. Uh, what do I do with my right hand? Well, what are these aspects and how are these notes uh, interacting with each other? How are these planets interacting with each other? And then trying to get my hands to move faster in order to understand it, which makes you like a better astrologer in terms of like understanding the archetypes and the interactions between these things more. And that's when the flywheel starts to go. So the faster your hands go, the quicker the interpretations start to come. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Cause I've learned a few languages. I'm not fluent in any one of them, but I know I, I knew French. I studied French for four years and then I was going to Hungary and I had to learn Hungarian, which is to me is like, I connected it to doing algebra with words because it was kind of the same idea. But when I couldn't huh. think of the Hungarian word while I was speaking it, the French would come out. It was almost like they were in the <laughs> same place in my head, like, you know, the, like a little safe or a little bank of of other languages. And it's like, okay, well, that one's not working. Let's switch to this one. That's interesting. But, I, and I knew because it was like, okay, this is a foreign word. It means what I'm trying to say, but I don't know the foreign word in this language to say it. So I'll say it in this foreign word. So the, all the foreign language um, connections were there. So when you say the music and the astrology interpretation was similar in your brain, perhaps it is it is close because you are looking at these different nuances of, of uh, meaning. It's certainly interesting, the science and acoustics of sound. And it's just um, very fascinating to me. I would love it if you would put something down, a theory or a, a journal article or something, but you, you also have the postcast podcast. Is, is that something that you you cover on that podcast is the music and astrology? Not yet. So I've been kind of slow with that right now. I've really just been doing the monthly forecast. I, I recorded all of my forecasts in December, 2021. And then I just break it up and post the each month's interpretations uh, as each month's, go month's goes on. And then I have a couple of episodes in the bank. I am just kind of getting my feet used to editing programs and all that stuff. So when my husband's home, it's a lot easier <laughs> to figure that stuff out. So I would love 
love to do a music and astrology episode a hundred percent. But yeah, we're, we're just in the baby stages of getting the stuff up and running really in terms of the other episodes that I want to do aside from just um, making forecasts. And then essentially what the idea of the podcast is, is to go back and figure out what made sense and what didn't make sense. And I think there is absolutely no shame in admitting when I got a prediction wrong, because first of all, if I got all the predictions right, I should be loaded rich. <laughs> and like if I had that done, um, but also it's like, it's a matter of trial and error. Um, you know, so I know some astrologers are very against uh, making predictions. And I'm like, well, what's the point? It, like, it doesn't matter in terms of trying to gain from it, but in terms of understanding how certain things come through, like the last three years, like my first prediction that uh, seems to be accurate each year is the last three years when Uranus goes direct. Finally, I'm at a point where this year is like, oh yeah, I'm expecting a volcano or earthquake in Asia. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I know that happens fairly in often. Asia. In, in yeah, Asia. yeah, and it, because if, what was it in 2020? The Philippines volcano went off right when uh, right around when Uranus went direct, mm -hmm. um, which was right by the Saturn Pluto conjunction. And then last year there was like a big uh, earthquake in Indonesia, which have I, I understand it happens fairly often, but um, kind of like what um, Richard Tarnas says in Cosmos and Psyche, he was like, mm -hmm. it's not that these things don't happen at other times; it's just that there is a cresting of the wave at these certain points. Um, and so, like then this year, the like I was ready to put money down on it, so that would be a <laughs> personal gain. So, you know, I, I wouldn't do that really. Um, but like the Tonga volcano uh, went off within three days of, uh, was it Uranus going direct? It's just a matter of with science that you would experiment and do trial and error to try and right. see you what stuff. I mean, there's observations. Just, yeah. Yeah. It's observations and trying to see like what makes sense, what doesn't. Um, and I just can't understand for the life of me why you wouldn't want to do that and then go back. And it's totally okay to get things wrong because that's how you learn. I think it's really interesting. I think it would be a great, um, a great thing to look at. And I, I think that even as a podcast, think how many musicians might be interested in putting together those ideas when you, when they hear, you know, yeah. what, what the theories, how the theories connect and how your ideas are coming. coming I think fruition. so many people who don't understand astrology, they criticize it thinking that they know astrology already. And like, I, I did not, <laughs> like newspaper. when I, when I, what's that? From the newspaper. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like when I first started studying astrology, like real, I've always been interested in it, but when I really went down the rabbit hole, like over two years ago, I was like, I don't want this bubblegum stuff. Like I kept finding these podcasts of just people who didn't seem to, it, it didn't impress me. And then I came across the astrology podcast. I'm like, oh my God, this is what I was looking for. Right. I wanted like an academic approach towards um, astrology and then understanding all the ancient stuff that I had no idea about, you know, like I knew what a birth chart looked like, but I didn't know how to read it. And then let alone all the ancient stuff, which I, that to me is just blowing my mind. Because if you think, you know, within the last 20, 30 years, all these texts that are getting translated and all the stuff that we don't know yet, how would that not keep people's minds still open to like, oh, well, what do we not know? You know, like, and, and what can we relearn as a society or, or understand um, in terms of how our universe works or, or even our personal relations to each other? Like, how can astrology help us with that? You know, and so I just feel like whenever people like really you know, dump on you for it. It's like, you just think it's a sun sign probably and have mm -hmm. absolutely no idea what the rest of it is. And one of the things I always say, and this had bothered me a lot too, and this is kind of, my brain was in the same area when I was trying to figure out what is astrology. And I went down the music theory rabbit hole. One, one of the things I thought to myself a lot, I'm like, what is it about when people just kind of shit on you for like liking astrology? I'm like, I don't need other people to believe it. That's not it. And it's like, I don't care what you believe. I'm like, you know what? That like, why do I still feel defensive for lack of better words? And I, I realize it's like, because no matter what, even at the end of the day, let's just say if astrology didn't work and this is all confirmation bias, which has to be a possibility out there. Now, I don't think that, but still, let's just say no matter what, there is still value based on like the history that I've relearned, um, the philosophy that you end up learning, and then the stories that people are willing to tell you. You gain so much more out of astrology than what you think you will when you first embark on this journey. And to me, it's like, no matter what happens, those three things have a lot of value to me. That's a great point. Well, we're coming up to the end of our time together, but I've been really stimulated mentally and intellectually <laughs> and from this whole conversation because there's so much possibility in looking 
further at this that I think you may be that person that we we start reading your books someday <laughs> who's who's talking about this and becoming the expert. Like even but, if it's already been figured out and I just haven't found the people who totally figured it out, like I haven't read Dane Rudyard or anything yet, which I know I need to, especially dealing with music and astrology. But I would said to you, like, I'm okay with failing. And this is one of the few areas in life where I say that, just like I was saying, like, it's okay to be wrong with an interpretation, et cetera. Because I think no matter what, like I will come out of this project with a different mindset and seeing things in a different way that it doesn't even matter if I'm the first person or not to do this. I think there's going to be something to get out of it just for myself, if nothing else. So I'm okay with going into it, not knowing how I'm coming out. I'm looking forward to hearing more from you. Thank Thank you you so much for your time and for coming to join us on this. And Um, I'm going to be looking at your Instagram, your Facebook, and and actually I want to hear more from your podcast because I did check out your monthly forecast and it's very efficient. It's, it tells what you need to know in a quick bite. It kind of helps not having any idea when it's months in advance and you're like, (laughs) I have no idea which direction (laughs) this is going, but you know, you just hear some words that I'm putting together and how I'm trying to make it make sense for what could potentially happen in the world. But I really have no idea. I would love to see you look at, okay, here's what I said was going to happen. And here's what happened. Well, that's exactly what the goal is. That's what I want to do with the post (laughs) podcast. So I've got those predictions. Now I got to figure out uh, how to edit it and stuff where where I go back and then I comment on the things that have happened, but I've been making notes, especially through my Instagram page, uh, Kate stop perspective. Um, like uh, as time is going on, I'm like, I'll, a lot of times in the morning, I'll Google first thing I will, um, Google for a certain keyword, which makes it feel like a little bit of cheating, but then I always comment on them. Like, did it, was this, something that I just saw on the newsfeed or did I go looking for something of this type of, um, like what was the word recently? Um, stalemate. I was looking for the word stalemate cause it didn't pop up in my news, but I, that's something that I felt like I was going to see. So, but I, I am very honest about how I am coming across these things because I think it's important to be as honest as we can to un- get a full understanding of it. That's a really good way of looking at things. It's a very digital high tech SEO <laughs> keyword perspective on, on connecting astrology to the world. It's good because this way you're documenting it all. And exactly. You know, That's the steady. idea is to document it so that when it, when something does happen or doesn't, you know, I can go back and be like, oh, I did call this out beforehand. So like there is the proof there already. So, well, thank you so much. I'd love to talk for, for oh, another thank you hour. So much. <laughs> There's so much to talk about, but I hope everybody will check out your podcast and your social media and I'm looking to hear more from you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care.